Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Arnaldo. I work for Red Hat since I guess forever, uh, for a long time. And uh, we'll be talking about something that people have been asking uh, me to do for a long time, which is trying to combine uh, two tools that I uh, work for a long time as well, which is the Linux Perf tools that I maintain in the Linux kernel and Peerhold, which was a tool that I wrote a long time ago when I, when I started looking at data structures in the Linux networking stack and how to reorganize them to get, to make them smaller, more cache efficient before I was even working with profiling and perf. So it's data structures. Normally when you are profiling or looking at code where, where you are, where, where things are happening and not on specifically on, on what things are being accessed. Uh, a data structure can be organized in many ways. If you, if you do it badly, it will use more memory. Uh, if you, uh, the placement of all the fields uh, have to be done in such a way that you exploit, you, uh, cache locality effects, you access a field, the next one you want will be afterward so you get just one, one one cache operation bringing things from memory to the to the cache hierarchy so it's important to think about it uh projects like the kernel have lots of work on having these in a optimal placement but this usually requires that you know a lot about the code that you are working on so you, I was talking with Eric Dumazier that does this a lot yesterday and said, no, how do you do it? Use some tool. We say, yeah, I use Payhole to, to see the, the, uh, uh, the layout and I use what I know about networking and, and, and what I know about how cache hierarchies work. So, well, yeah, but we, we should try to automate that. And as we will see, uh, there is, there are, facilities in hardware now that help us to, to do that. And there are tools in Perf that are exploiting these to some degree. There are some problems. I will show how, what those problems are and what ideas are being, I'm thinking about or the people are thinking about to, 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 for the tool to do more and, and, and require less uh, domain specific uh, knowledge. So it's, uh, if you, if on, on a CPU, you have a, a cache hierarchy. So the closer to the CPU you are, uh, the, 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 the data that you are going to access, the better, it will be faster. But you have this thing about the, the first level, second level, the less level cache, and then you, you, you have memory that are not local to your CPU. You, it's on another Newman node. So you, you have to try to avoid accessing things uh, in a not optimal way. So just to a recap, you have like at the LS topo uh, utility shows you on, on this machine, on my machine, which is just a notebook, uh, more or less the hierarchy. If it was a NUMA, uh, you would have another block like this connected to these, and then there would be an interconnect. Uh, AMD has a kind of interconnect. Uh, Intel had Q QPI and now has Ultra, uh, a new one since the Skylake. Uh, the problems that we are thinking is like uh, you you have non cache aligned arrays, and then when you access something, you you get part of it in a cache line and the other part on another cache line. Uh, we are we are trying to avoid that you have things that are mostly read with things that are mostly written on the same cache line. If if you have that, as we're going to see, the, the cache line will be not uh, it's effectively effectively as uh, uh, nullifying the, the the benefits of the cache 
Uh, lots of this was were, were, was fixed over the years in Project Collected Linux Kernel um, by profiling and uh, adding annotations to, to, to lots of places. So we should learn from it. So, but it's tedious. Uh, lots, of, but lots of this was done, but manually tinkering. You think that this, like, like I said from Eric Domas, you, you think that this is wrong because you, you see the cache line in your mind and etc. But it, it's, let's see how to to improve that. You people just oh the, uh, I know what are the hardware limits for this, and we are not getting there. So let me try to find what are the the issues, and then they do some perf start on it. Look at the, the the counters, and then they do some changes, and then try it again. It improves it, and then try to find some explanation for that. Sometimes it's difficult. The, the guys from AMD were talking about so, some cases where they couldn't believe that uh, the accesses on one, C, one CPU core would prime the cache for another CPU. And then the, the performance, uh, they, they got to, 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 to find the performance regression by just trying one thing after the other. And uh, so they were asking if uh, Perf could try to help with, with that. We were discussing some ideas, perhaps in the future. So manually doing it. If you look at the kernel's uh, commit log, uh, git repository, and look for false sharing, let's say, one of these issues, you're going to find lots of, of places where people uh, sometimes use Perf to, to find this uh, already, We're using a tool that they'll be describing. And in other cases, they don't report what they use it, but they fix the, the issues nonetheless. Uh, the first example. So Eric in uh, 2021, recent, um, that there are two variables, one after the other, and one is for something, the other one is for something unrelated or mildly related. So the memory allocated and the number of sockets allocated. Uh, so they were, one after the other, they were less than, they, they, they fit into a single cache line. So when you touch one, you evaluate the other. The, what, what he did was just added that cache line and line in, in SMB to both. So they are now at the start of a, of a cache line and you remove this problem. So that was the way he was doing it. We are thinking how to detect this, like, a, oh, this is a cache line that's being validated frequently. What is in there? Oh, two variables. Oh, maybe those two variables are not related. So the suggestion the tool would do, would, would make, would be oh, move them. Uh, you could even write a patch, let's say. Another case uh, was looking at the kernel. The, 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 the last line is the commit log message. Uh, he was always, when, when some decision, uh, when, there was this bitmap and then there was some condition and on this condition he was unconditionally uh, 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 this condition was setting some bit that was related to some block or something like that and so this the solution that he did was to uh, uh, test if the value there was already the one that that he uh, was desired and, and if so don't touch it and so he got an improvement with that. Uh, so basically, it changed. It was like sector dirty, set bit. No, test first and set uh, afterwards and got the performance improvement. A page counter. Uh, two variables. One was mostly written. The other one was mostly read. Uh, he used perf C2C, which I will describe, and the facility in the processor that allows perf C2C to do the work. There is the bug report, and then the fix. The fix was moving it to another place and uh, 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 documenting this. So the first time we see PA hole on this presentation, so this is the new struct. So you see that PA hole shows the layout with the offsets, the size of of the, the types and the cache line boundaries. So uh, parent is now on a different uh, cache line than usage. So that specific problem was solved. So 
for the layout, uh, when Pihole started, it was using Dwarf. That, that's what GDB uses, et cetera, but it's, it's really big. And then there came BPF, and BPF needed something more compact, just like uh, Solaris had with uh, CTF. So now, when you build the kernel, it gets the debugging information, the dwarf that GCC generates, uses P-hole, converts to BTF, BTF is linked with the kernel, it's always available. It's fast to access, you have it always there. So it's much more convenient now, and it's being used for lots of cases, and this is this tool is, is one case where it will be used again. It also records information about per CPU variables, type, variable types. So uh, you can use that as well to do some other analysis. There, there are patches now that uh, are recording, that proposing, rec I will talk about that later, but uh, uh, proposing recording the types for all global variables, not just per CPU. So it's compact, it's from BPF, it's used in BPF, for example, for compiler once run everywhere to compare the types that are used on some BPF bytecode in the, in the kernel and then do adjustments, relocations if needed so that you can use the same BPF bytecode for different kernels with, uh, if the kernel changes some of the districts that's used, you adapt. Um, if you look at this kernel BTF is where it's there, you see the, the size for uh, VM Linux, then you have 204 uh, entries there, one per module. Uh, the, the, the modules have just the types that it, you, it, it are unique to this um, uh, kernel module and refers to the main VM Linux for the types that are, are there to avoid duplication. And so nowadays, if you go to command line and say peerhole, whatever, any type in the kernel, it will instantaneously print the, 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 the the finish for, for this. And then you, you can see some interesting things like uh, uh, the, the cache line uh, boundaries, if the last struct has uh, padding, and this can be used for all kinds of analysis, interesting decisions. Inside the kernel, like the, the kernel can use this information to, like the BPF verify uses this to, to make decisions. So uh, uh, it's interesting to, to they have this kind of detail. So you can think about like, oh, before that list head, there is, I, I, I will put a list head uh, just after the, that 60 bytes hole, uh, the, the alignment. So what's before it, it's not some, I mean, it's not something that is important, perhaps. Um, the CPU helps, uh, the new CPU. Uh, uh, Intel, since a long time ago, they, they have PEBS, which precision uh, enhanced uh, branch sampling or something like that. And AMD has something uh, uh, similar and ARM has as well. Um, ARM uses like a hardware tracing and then uh, synthesizes um, the perf record events in user space. And then the, the rest of the tooling can, can go consume it. First step, the, the example for uh, Pebs uh, doc, describing what it, it does. Basically, you ask the processor to randomly sample load operations, and when it finds some load operation that is over, let's say, 50 cycles, so that that's in, in, uh, taking too long, and then I want to sample this thing, I want to record what is the cache line where this happened, the, the data address for that's being accessed on the cache hierarchy, what is the uh, EP address that uh, caused this? And then you can, and, and was, what was the, the load latency? And then there's some information about weighting this, this uh, sample. Um, what do we have in Perf that, to, to help with that? Uh, as I said before, Perf start can be used as a crude method. You can run it before, then you do a modification, run it again, you see the counters, and then you, Infer, I have perf main, uh, that's the first one to use this load latency stuff. We're gonna see some examples, C2C, cache to cache, to cache that is perf main doing something else to, to try to match what is writing, what's reading with, with a, a, load, a high load latency. 
there are lots there are several articles about using it people using it in the real world uh, on the perf wiki that will be a link at the end there are some pointers to this so you can see oh how people use this what was the use case and then try to use this as education material but we should improve on, on top of that perf may uh, loads and stores and the load latency was written by stefan arania and several other people over the years have been helping in improving it, adding new features. Uh, so how does it work? If you do perfman record dash A for system wide and then run it while that workload is, is running for one second, which is the usual way for you to run per for a period of time, then you can see uh, what are the memory accesses that were happening in the system uh, during this one second, you can see the, uh, the various uh, levels of uh, the, the cache hierarchy and uh, the, if it was a miss and etc. And you can infer something from this. Uh, using the usual uh, perf uh, workflow, you, you, if you remove that uh, dash A, then it's not system wide. What we, will be profiled is just a sleep. Uh, process. So it's just uh, a few events for that happens when you are running that specific workload. But you can you could re replace that with perfmem record dash C and then see what's happening on just just a subset of the CPUs of the system or a C group or, or uh, so on and so forth. So a familiar workload. I, I was I, I was doing a kernel build. And then I did perfman record uh, for one minute. And then you get uh, different from, from the other one for this specific, for, for the whole system. You see that the data symbol is one of the things that we, we have to work. Uh, it's difficult to map back from a data symbol to a variable. I mean, it was, so uh, you don't have a map that says, so oh, here is a slab there. That's, I mean, you can, it, there are something that you can map back. Uh, we, uh, we, that Esther, Esther Lang uh, was on some kernel read only memory. The other one, the data object, we, we resolve it, but not the, the, the data symbol. Perhaps it you see, cache to cache. Uh, it's trying to, to uh, uh, see the loads that are slow and match for the same using the, the data cache line that's being accessed uh, match with the rights and so you will look who is invalidating this uh, and then you will try to resolve this by uh, moving to different cache lines uh, one thing that that uh, the pbs uh, load latency uh, can give you is the offset inside the the cache line uh, we're going to see the, this later so the origins for for c2c are were in hpux back uh, the, this guy dick Fowles, uh, was hired by red hat sometime to work on having something similar on on intel since P they they realized that pebs had provided the the, the hardware mechanism that was available in the past and allowed this tool to be written in, in uh, HPUX. So they, they come up with proof of concept. Then G, EG Ultra got this uh, reorganized so that it, it, it looked more like uh, a perf subcommand. And then we, at, at, after so many iterations, we added it to perf. So uh, the C2C output instead, perf main was just showing the memories where there was uh, latency. So, so the areas, but it's not trying to match with the right operations. It will show lots of information uh, about Numa nodes, how many CPUs accessed that. Uh, there are lots of information. So that's one of the problems of the tool is that because it's difficult to, to, for you to interpret the, the results. But let's try. So you run like this, perf C2C record dash A is let is one system wide. And if you do perf f list to, to, to see what, what was being recorded, so you're going to see that is the mem loads on the CPU uh, performance monitoring units. And furthermore, it's uh, configured to record just the 
a load operations that took more than 30 cycles, 30 CPU cycles. You, you could say 150 and get more NUMA node uh, traversals, or you can put even more if you want to see something that's really contended to reduce the amount of data that's been collected. So it's a way for you to filter at the processor level. So it's a lot of information. I mean, uh, just like with, uh, with Perfman, it, it will say like that what was the kind of operation that caused this, but that, and then, but, the, but this is with PerfScript and looking just at the events on CPU four and for uh, uh, when it was idle. Even uh, when idle, there are a lot of things happening. So what was really asked? You, you do perf f list uh, dash v to see the details for this event. So on the sample type, you ask what is to be on each of the, the samples. Uh, you're going to have the IP, the TID, a timestamp, the address. But, but most of this is used for all the events. For this specific case, you are asking for the data source, the physical address, and the, the weight struct so that you can like uh, apply some weight that based on, on some numbers that the hardware provides. Um, and what's on the perf uh, sample data SRC? You have the load latency that's obtained from PBS or, or equivalent uh, uh, part of the, of the CPU from other architectures like IBS on, on AMD. And you get the opcode if it was a load, a store, a prefetch, or an ex execution. You have the memory level that uh, this data is being accessed. The TLB is no, that there are lots of information on, on this. We are using uh, basically part of this, but more can be done uh, as we get this more, uh, uh, more tools using it, more people aware of, of what's possible. So the weight, it's hard to provide a number, how is expensive this sample action represents. So the profile use this to uh, scale samples. Uh, so the header, if you, I, I, I'm, I'm using the, the, those comments uh, uh, because this is the usual workflow for perf. You run a record phase for some events, then generate a perf data file, then you can use like perf report header only and see what's collected. So again, the sample type is uh, like the uh, show before, the number of CPUs, that there is information about topology. There are lots of other information that are collected when you run this, this comment. Uh, the, when you say perf c to c report stats, there are key metrics that, there are way more metrics than this, but the one we are interested in is this heat modified, is when you, you get to the cache it's there, but it's marked as modified. So you have to go to the other cache and get this information to synchronize with your cache. Uh, this is not a NUMA machine, so uh, only uh, local heat modified happened. When you, uh, you have, as we saw in that LS topo uh, picture, you have caches that are local to each core, and then you have less level cache. So it could be validated one of the CPUs and the other CPU is accessing, so it has to go there and synchronize. That's what we want to see. So the first, uh, the first shared data cache line table, it will show what are the cache line addresses that are being contained the most. It's way, uh, there are way more information about the room, remote uh, heat amps, but I compressed this to fit on the screen and to show just the local heat amps. So, we, we, we see this and we pick one of those uh, and start analyzing. So we get the uh, one of those is, is this one. So the tool will tell you uh, the number of heat modified that that uh, uh, code address is finding. And so, and we'll try to resolve the code address to a source code online so let, at the end you have it's on the mod node page state on the vm stat file and uh, uh, line 379 and then the other ones as well and so you see that some are our load operations next step so we have to look at the offset you see that cl offset is the offset 
inside this, this that data cache line where the access caused this this uh, where the load was done the field on one of the cache lines so one of the data structures that we're trying to find out which one is so we look at it uh, we see that three fields being accessed because there are three different offsets uh, or perhaps one is an array uh, and we have to find out what is the data structure we have to look at this source code so if we go to vm start 379 using another perf tool which is perf probe perf probe will locate the, the dwarf debug information that's appropriate for this kernel and if you use capital l and vmstat dot uh, comma uh, 379 then you, you you show the source code for that so at the line 379 we see that speech, uh, it, it's a uh, uh, per cpu pg uh, pg that so pg that we have to find out what is the type for that uh, variable so if we use another tool that's with phole, which is pfunct, and you, you tell the, the name of the function, it will use the BTF information that's always available, and we will figure out this, and we will show that PG that is struct PG list data. And then we look at PG list data and look for that field that the per CPU node stats, ask for something before and after, so we discovered that's the, that it, it's this cache line uh, at the end of that uh, function. So we, now we have offsets in there and sizes for the function, for, for the fields, and we can figure out what are the fields. So this is manual. We want to have this automated, uh, or move, at least helping move uh, when navigating the, the, the profile. You click there, and it opens the, the, so the annotation view, and then you can uh, click on the type, a P whole browser would appear and then you would move more quickly. Uh, so lots of manual steps. We have to streamline it. We have a perfect browser, uh, a TUI. Uh, so yeah, and uh, we, we should go to the P whole automatically back and forth. Uh, so we, we, if we go to refresh CPU VM stats, we're going to see who is writing. Here or not, though. Yes, um, I would like to join here. Go ahead. So the compiler already knows what data structure and which variable inside it um, is related to the instruction it emits. So when we have a code address for a load or for a store, the compiler knew what data structure is associated with it. We don't need to go reverse engineer that. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 I, I will get. To, I, I think I will get to that uh, on, on the next slide. We, 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 we I mean, the, the compiler could help. That that's something that Stefan Arena and Google say that he was working with the compiler guys at, at Google to try yeah, but to. But he said get the this. same when C to C was introduced. I almost knacked C to C for not doing this. Um, yeah, and it's still not done. Yeah, right. I mean, this is, uh, he was a guy who was complaining about the C2C. So the, the, uh, this presentation is about me finding time to do the presentation, to get to the issues, to get to the complaints, and try to work on this. So I, I have most of this in my, in my cache now. So I, I hope in the, in, uh, that in the next weeks or, or months, I will be getting to uh, what you were alluding to. Okay, but yeah, the tools people should get involved because it's yes. safe to reverse engineer this data when the compiler already knows it when it writes the instructions. Right, I I I, I agree. I mean, on, on original architectures, yes. Uh, on x86, you have one instruction that access multiple memory locations. So you still need to eventually figure out which one of these you're actually accessing. Uh, I, I, the, the Those are help. fairly rare. Yes, they do exist. And there is, but the, the, for most cases, it's just a sing, single memory location. 
and those okay. cases are trivial to do. The other instructions, yes, they're a pain. But let's let's just do the simple things first. Messing with compilers is not something I would call simple, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Joe Mario at, at Red Hat, he uses these and fixes problems. It's cumbersome, but uh, it gets us to where we were not before. So uh, we, it gets us closer to where we want. And uh, again, this presentation and trying to get more people. There's something else. Uh, the AMD guys uh, uh, had a problem and they, after they fixed it, they realized that, oh, if I had perf to c I could have saved the time at diagnosing this. And they realized that perf c doesn't work on AMD. So they submitted the patches to make uh, uh, perf c c or load latency, etc., work on AMD. And the ARM64 guys did the same. So. There are more people now looking at this and hopefully in understanding the code, the issues, and hopefully you're going to get to a, uh, the next step. I, I was not even uh, like too much worried about not having solved this so far because then it, uh, plumbers is for that, just to raise the question, raise the problems and try to get more people involved. So we do this reverse engineering and find out where it was that it uh, the causing the, the invalidation right into that cache line. Uh, and if you look at the comment for this specific data structure, uh, people realized it and did it in such a way to avoid going to other Numa nodes. But there is still the problem on the uh, uh, current uh, CPU. So this problem may be uh, intrinsic to this specific algorithm. I'm not going to that. I'm not analyzing this to, to the end. I'm just showing this specific case because it was the one that that one that, that appeared and I could use as an example of the difficulties involved with the current solution. So uh, to, 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 to incrementally help with this, like increment people who are using it already, we on the peer hole, we should have, let's say, uh, uh, another uh, option to, to ask for offsets inside cache lines. So you, uh, you had the offset from the start of the shirt, but we want the offset from the start of the cache line. Um, yeah, like, like PG that in the previous example was on the last cache line, and then we had to do some calculations uh, to, to get to those offsets. Uh, yeah, so it's all focused on when things happen, not on the data, but you have to look, you have to, but helps to figure out to some degree. Uh, how, how we can get back from, from symbols, the, uh, ha the compiler helping us is not, not one that is there, but should be. But because as a tooler, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly trying at first to use what's available. I, I'm not going to change the kernel or change the compiler. I would love to do this, but this takes more time. So using what's there can improve the current situation and show what are the shortcomings with the compiler, with the kernel, with how we build things, and et cetera. Um, and, and this is like a detour. Like uh, we, we uh, with, with perf C2C, you have uh, uh, the usual perf uh, uh, workflow. You have to record, get the perf data file, and then, then do post-processing analysis. This is okay in many cases, but in other cases, it's really cumbersome because you have lots of data. So uh, we have to use uh, get uh, uh, BPF to to solve one more problem. So. Uh, we have now in Perf um, several BPF scales. So Perf now uses BPF to do in kernel aggregation, to create like virtual uh, counters, or to, uh, to to do things like B BCC does using Lay BPF. So you have several f uh, 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 features like off CPU profiling, locking contention, uh, st statistics about uh, kernel work, like for, for uh, how long it takes from a kernel work to be uh, scheduled and then run, and uh, all sorts of things 
can be done along with perf, but behind the scenes is BPF with perf, uh, so they are combined while preserving the perf workflow. So the way you specify what you want to, 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 to profile or trace is the same, but behind the scenes, it uses BPF. So perf lock contention, uh, uh, capital uh, uh, B, to use BPF, it, it works just like you do that, and after a while, press Ctrl C, and it provides uh, information about what it aggregated in kernel. So we are now considering using uh, adding sampling to BPF, so that when sampling uh, the the interrupt happens, a BPF program can run and then do some filtering, and uh, in the kernel or do aggregation. So perf C to C could be done this way doing aggregation there and then when you stop you get the the the, the uh yeah btf already talked code annotation we have perf notate and things like that this is a slide about uh the effects of uh, a harder uh, uh problem mitigation like but i don't have time to, to show that but this is just to, to exemplify how code annotation is done you have the the, the percentages for the events that are being and then uh, the the idea the, the the end result that we want is to do data structure annotation using PAO instead of centering on the code to center it on a data structure so we're gonna get that information and show in the data structure where what are the things that are being contended and uh, perhaps uh, help uh, give hints about changes for you to do, or do it automatically and recompile the kernel. That would be the end result. Yeah, that, that, and, and here you have lots of uh, uh, links for more in-depth uh, 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 texts about uh, cache coherency, what are, what's involved, what we are trying to avoid. And then there is the article for uh, Joe, Joe Mario, the original one for Perf C2C, and these useful links on the Perf Wiki I have all this and more. So uh, that's what I had to say today. Are there any more questions? Okay, so to start out with this online question, um, this is from Igor Guryanov. Perf seems to generate a lot of information. How badly? Does it distort caching statistics, especially on systems with small caches or multi-core systems? But did it still be usable? C can you repeat? Yeah, uh, the problem is uh, it generates lots of information, so he's concerned that it's going to, perf itself will be corrupting the cache. Yeah, I didn't got it. But uh, it's about statistics, about the, the, the cache validation or uh, it just says, how badly does it distort caching statistics? Depends on how much data you generate. So if you have a long running stable process, you can sample at a very low uh, rate and that will generate less data per time and disturb caches less. It's always a trade off. Yeah. I mean, yeah. watching something changes that thing you're watching. It's always. Yeah, I, I think it will. Yeah. Um, but overall, purpose. Yeah, yeah. Overall, perf is extremely useful in production. So, like, it's you can sample and and not distort like beyond what you're sampling, and then you're done with it, and you don't really need to care about it. So, in general, like you, you you'll, you'll you, you might see like small spikes and in, in, in latencies or or the effects of uh, destroying the cache, but um, in general, I that's that's not something I'd be concerned with. Yeah, this this is I mean uh, this is very specialized stuff. I mean for for the use case I see is the AMD doing a patch to uh, uh, improve uh, scheduling performance on their uh, chip, and then uh, there is a small change in uh, in layout for per CPU variables, and the performance goes down, and and, and they can't figure it out. So using a tool like this will help that. The previous question is about, I think that it was about the high volume. Yes, as, as Peter said, you can reduce the frequency or you can even ask the PEBS 
to only record things that are over that, uh, that, that number of cycles. So you can use this in, 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 in production. And uh, if we use something like the BPF mo mode that is being uh, uh, thinked, thought about, you, you, you can avoid having a big file. So it, it's a, a, another way of reducing the overhead of, of doing this kind of analysis. Hey, Arnaldo, I've got a question on Nick. Um, so I guess um, maybe an inter interesting observation and then a, a, a perhaps naive question. Um, so uh, I, the statement is uh, if, if developers are interested in trying to find um, when they have excessive padding in their data structures, I saw an interesting zero day report the other day. So it looks like the folks running zero day bot, they are running, they're starting to run Clang Tidy and there's an analysis in there called excessive padding warning. And it will it will print if you have like more than 10 bytes of padding or something. I don't know precisely what the heuristic is, and it will actually tell you the optimal sort for your members. Um, so I think PA holes is fantastic. I, I love it, especially once you start embedding structs within structs. Yeah. You very quickly, like you you, you kind of yeah, we can expand them. Like and you can't, uh, you, you, without jumping to the definition, you can't do the alignment in your head. Of like you know what what is the excessive padding kind of thing? Um, what, maybe the what does Clang Tidy think is optimal? Uh, it, I don't know. It'll do the sort and it'll tell you how to minimize the padding. Yeah, right? mi minimize, but that might not be optimal. Uh, sure, but it's going to ignore like. Huh? Sure. Sure. Right, but you need some kind of attribute or some pragma or something to say like I'm doing something tricky here, so. Ignore this from the analysis. Sure, those exist. Um, anyways, the perhaps naive question about some of the cache line sharing stuff is, um, so I'm I'm almost curious. Like cache lines are different. I assume are different size between different machines, yeah. different architectures, different micro architectures. Is there ever the case where someone is maybe um, over optimizing for a specific machine with some of this cache line sharing stuff where? Maybe things now are separate cache lines. No, well, I mean, machine, in the kernel, when you have the the that those uh, annotations, the cache line aligned on SMB, it takes into consideration the cache line size for that specific architecture. Mm -hmm. So the, the the alignments in different architectures will be different. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are all sorts. Of, I mean, the, 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 Eric Domazé was saying something like, "Oh, uh, you have to disable cache line prefetching." So because uh, it's 64 bytes, but if you have it enabled, and sometimes the machine comes enabled in the in the in the BIOS, so the cache line is not 64 bytes; mm. it's uh, 128. So the kernel should see that and 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 behave in a different way. Or this, uh, what he does is disables this. What P. Hole could do is detect this and and uh, and show. So oh, this is the, the the cache line size, but this is the uh prefetched cache line size mm. and then that's this can help in understanding performance problems cool. so there are more things that can be done in pa hole and i i, I i'd love to hear uh, britain send me emails so that i can go on making it better yeah thanks i have a follow-up question for that so you showed multiple ways to fix those fault sharing right yeah. one was the uh cache line aligned but the one was also just reordering the members yeah right and right. that one would not take into account like different sizes of cache lines right it could yeah. work on one but not on the other so what's the is cache line aligned the best way to do it because uh, i mean uh, i i i was i was just trying to show some examples and i and and and, uh, and perhaps uh that was the quickest way for the guy to fix that at that time and uh, uh eric Dumas here to do it but but if there is another way of getting it close to another uh, variable that's read mostly, you, you group, group first the read mostly, and then you, or, or you group some things that are related, which is even better, because then you get something and then you get the other one for free. So that would be another way to do it, a better way to do it, you see? So uh, that, that's another way. You Instead of adding all this padding, yeah. you, get the padding and put something that will be probably used after that one and will not generate cost for, for false sharing. Yeah, because if you have a struct with only two members and yeah. they are false sharing and you align them, you'll yeah. make it 
super large. You would yeah. need two cache lines for. Yeah, right. I mean, you should reorganize your data structure, break it down. We use another algorithm. Uh, there are many ways uh, to do this. Okay, so I, we have, we're almost out of time, but I sense, is there a question over? Go ahead, please. I, I was just going to mention that, like, that if you just look at struct page, like it, it, it will, it will assume 64 bit, 64 byte um, cache lines. So, like, it's kind of like hard coded um, into the notion of like how members are are, are distributed in the in the data structure. Um, so, I, yeah. like in that sense, like I guess um, the a holes showing like. Um, reorder members instead of like uh, right. Cache. He who has a dash, dash reorganize option, but it's right. really naive. Right. Yeah. Really naive. Just moving to make it smaller. Uh, having this kind of hints from hardware could get into this uh, algorithm and then say, oh, th those things are really uh, not causing or uh, combine it with uh, co compiler help. Combine it with, uh, I mean, the annotations that are already there. So you could. You could, that there was somebody talking about the kernel doing uh, data structure reorganizing for security reasons. And people are saying, oh, it's not a problem if you, if you move just the cache lines around, because then all the annotations that were done remain valid and you get some uh, randomization of the access. So, I mean, th th there are lots of things that can be done uh, with, with something that seemingly, I mean, Silly, yeah. The order of fields in a in a data structure. To pick up on a few comments before, uh, unfortunately, it's not completely an exact science. Uh, cache lines are not necessarily architected, uh, which means even for a given ISA, you can have different implementation with different cache lines sizes. For PowerPC, typically is like that, and we have 64 byte or 128 byte in some in some cases. Um, struct page is struct page. <laughs> I mean, they, the, the point is, these things is we don't want to make it twice as big, and so uh, at the end of the day, we, we do the best we can for the most common case, which is 64 bytes. Um, and and it's going to be a lot of these, uh, where thankfully 64 is some the most common cases, and probably where people will will, will thrive to optimize for, uh, and, and then we we see where we go from there. Yeah, another comment that somebody made was. Sometimes you, you optimize the data structure, it improves some workload, but then pessimize another one. So you have to have that in mind. Okay, so we need, we're out of time. We have a okay. final comment from Feng Tang, who is looking forward to the annotations. Uh, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you for being here.